Good morning to you all. My name is Mary Howarth and I am the Director of the Office of Philanthropic Partnerships and Alumni here at the University of York and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you all to Dr Heather Melville's inauguration ceremony this morning. I have just a couple of announcements to make before we begin so that you can all relax and enjoy the ceremony. First of all, if the fire alarm should sound at any point, please remain in your seats. Instructions will be given and we will escort you to the nearest exit. Can I ask you all please to mute your mobile phones or devices, but of course please do take lots and lots of photographs. And finally, um, if you're comfortably able, will you please now stand. Lady Mayoress, Chancellor-elect, welcome to the University of York. Uh, my name is Charlie Jeffrey, and I'm the Vice Chancellor. And it is my very pleasant task to declare this special congregation open for the conferment of awards and, indeed, other important matters. Please be seated. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce Robert Hollingworth and the 24 who will perform Timor et Tremor by Orlando Stasis. Sit 
Thomas Beecham, famous English conductor, said, the English don't like music, just the noise it makes. To make sure that isn't the case now, I'm just going to tell you what this means. It's possibly not the best choice of text. It starts, Timor et Fear. Fear and trembling came upon me. In Latin, fear and trembling came upon me. Uh, have mercy on me, O God. Hear my prayer. Let me not be confounded. And Lassus writes a joke into the piece. It's not a very funny joke. Uh, but in it, he writes rather difficult notation for the last few bars on the word, let me not be confounded. And if you were reading this from a part book with only your part, it would have certainly confounded you at the first performance.
Thank you so much, uh, Robert and the 24, for a, a fantastic start to this uh, uh, very special congregation. Now, the main purpose of uh, this congregation is to install our new chancellor. The seventh in the history of the University of York, following the end of the term of office of Professor Sir Malcolm Grant. So what is the position of Chancellor at the University of York? On one level, the answer is straightforward. The Chancellor presides over the University's court, which is a body which brings together local and regional stakeholders together with University staff to advise and support the university in its activities and ambitions. <clears throat> On another level, the answer is a little more mystical. The chancellor has few formal powers, but brings to the university instead a less tangible, but nonetheless vital, sense of authority and legitimacy. The chancellor embodies and represents values more than powers. Perhaps a little like the monarch in constitutional monarchies. Something the British constitutional expert Walter Badgett described as the dignified part of the constitution. As opposed to the grubbier parts of the constitution found in the prime minister and the cabinet. <laughs> or by extension in this analogy, the grubbier bits of the university constitution, like the vice chancellor and the university executive board. As the embodiment of that more mystical or dignified part of our constitution, I'm delighted to present Dr. Heather Melville, OBE, as our seventh chancellor. Now let me say a little about Heather. She is an enormously successful business leader, largely in the finance sector, including at the Royal Bank of Scotland and PwC, and more recently in the management consultancy Teneo. These are all major businesses, and what Heather has done in them has been hugely important. She's been an advocate for the advancement of both women and people of colour in all of them, but also in the wider sectors of which they are part. In RBS's focused women's network, in PwC's Colour Brave Charity Committee, in the Chartered Management Institute and its Women's Advisory Committee, as a patron of women in banking and finance. At Teneo, she's managing director of the equality practice, helping companies to attract, develop, and retain the very best talent by in, uh, nurturing inclusive cultures. Heather was awarded the OBE in 2017 for her services to gender equality. She is featured in several listings of the most influential black Britons. She has won and will shortly receive another honorary degree in recognition of her achievements. She is an outstanding individual. She's already brought some of the insight and expertise that stems from those roles and that recognition to the university in contributing to our Festival of Ideas in 2019 as part of a section on the theme, A Fair Economy, A Better World. And also in advising one of our most important equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives, the Yorkshire Consortium for Equity in Doctoral Education. Bit of a mouthful, but that, that consortium was set up to tackle the under-representation of people of colour in UK academia at source by exploring barriers to entry to PhD study, the starting point of an academic career, and working to remove those barriers. I spoke on the same panel as Heather at one of the early meetings of the consortium. And my goodness, you could see not only the passion she brought to the room, but the inspiration 
she gave to a whole host of young, aspirant academics of colour. So it's in those ways that Heather brings with her what I called the less tangible but nonetheless vital sense of authority and legitimacy to the university and to the role of chancellor. Her values align with those that founded and have sustained this university. The University of York was founded as an expression of a local civic tradition which campaigned against inequality and for responsible business. The university cared and cares about access to higher education more than almost anything else. It sought to work from the outset regardless of class, creed or race. Its purpose was and is the amelioration of human life and conditions. Now that alignment of values is what led us to approach Heather. And so, after initial correspondence, I went to meet Heather in London to ask whether she would take on the role. And she didn't actually say yes or no. She was already way ahead of me. What she said was, I'm not just going to be a figurehead, you know. Well, I took that as a yes. But I also said to myself, brilliant. That's exactly what we wanted. To be able to draw on Heather's vast experience, wisdom and insight to help the university in identifying, releasing and nurturing the talents of students and colleagues from all backgrounds and in understanding better how those talents can be deployed in ways which reflect a social as well as an economic purpose. Heather, let me extend on behalf of our colleagues and students the warmest of welcomes to the University of York. We all look forward immensely to working with you on equality, enterprise and much more in the coming years. And now the formal bit. Dr. Heather Melville, OBE. On behalf of all members of the university, and with the power vested in me by the University of Court, I have great pleasure in installing you as Chancellor of the University of York. Heather will give her inaugural address later on in the ceremony. I, I think she might need a moment to, to process that. Um, but before then, uh, we have some other important matters to deal with. Professor Karen Rawlingson, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, will now present honorary graduate Dame Alison Rose to the Chancellor.
Chancellor. It is both a privilege and a pleasure to present to you our honorary graduand, Dame Alison Rose, Chief Executive Officer of NatWest Group, who has not only excelled in her career, but also worked to increase inclusivity and accessibility in the entrepreneurial and finance sectors, a commitment to public good which resonates with the ethos of this university. I'm also delighted to congratulate Alison on receiving her damehood in this year's New Year's Honours list. Alison Rose began her career at NatWest as a graduate, having completed her degree in history at Durham University, and has since worked her way up the company, becoming the first woman to lead one of the UK's big four banks upon her appointment as CEO in 2019. Throughout her diverse career at NatWest, Alison has held a number of key positions, including Chief Executive of Commercial and Private Banking and Global Head of International Banking Capital and Balance Sheet, demonstrating the wide reach of both her personal aptitudes and her vision for the company. She has been instrumental in leading NatWest Group's progress and performance as a purpose-led organisation most notably in her involvement with improving accessibility in the world of business and finance. Perhaps the most significant of these improvements was the 2019 Alison Rose Review of Female Entrepreneurship, commissioned by the UK government, and so called because it was Alison who led this investigation into the barriers to women starting a business. The results of this review cited some of the major contributing factors to this inequality, such as the lack of female members on UK investment teams, and ultimately revealed that closing the gender gap would not only be the right thing to do from an equalities perspective, but also contribute a further £250 billion to the UK economy. Since then, Rose Review initiatives have seen tens of thousands of entrepreneurs across the UK benefiting from funding, advice and mentoring schemes, while thousands of students have received enterprise training leading to significant year-on-year -year growth in female-led startups. Such progress led also to the introduction of the 100 Female Entrepreneurs to Watch list, which was celebrated at the recent Women Mean, mean Business Conference. Here, Alison, who led the event, spoke publicly about the importance of visibility and role models, and the inspiring impact of seeing someone who is like you being successful demonstrating her passion and outspoken advocacy, not only for women in business, but also for all minoritised groups in need of greater representation. Indeed, Alison has also taken on the role of executive sponsor for NatWest Group's employee-led networks, ensuring that all vo voices within the company are heard. Alison's goal to expand the reach of entrepreneurial and financial expertise extends also to young people, as demonstrated by her involvement in NatWest's recent creation, the Thrive Programme, in collaboration with the National Youth Agency and Marcus Rashford, MBE, whose aim is to address the lack of financial confidence and literacy amongst young people today, no matter what their background. At the forefront of this programme has been listening to community and youth workers themselves and hearing their concerns around money as something to worry about instead of as a positive tool for them to thrive. This is something we must seek to change, Alison Rose maintains. This necessity for improving access to financial and entrepreneurial knowledge is clear to see in all aspects of Alison's work. Not content with these success successes within NatWest Group alone, Alison has also taken it upon herself to use her expertise and influence for public good, acting as chair of the Scottish Business in the Community Advisory Board and being a member of the International Business Council for the World Economic Forum, as well as being director of Coote's Charitable Foundation and member of the UK government's Help to Grow Advisory Council, to name but a few. With such a career already under her belt, and no doubt many more achievements to come, we are proud to welcome Alison here today. Chancellor, for her tireless dedication towards promoting gender equality and greater access to financial and entrepreneurial opportunities for all, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Dame Alison Rose for the degree of Doctor of the University Honoris Causa.
the University of York, I have the great pleasure in conferring upon you the degree of the University, Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. so much. Chancellor, thank you. Um, Vice-Chancellor, Dean and Professors, thank you so much for this honour. It is very humbling to be here today and to be part of such a distinguished group, so um, huge gratitude from me. We all believe very deeply in the importance of learning and the power of the difference that it can make in people's lives um, and why it's such a privilege to accept this honorary degree. The University of York has long prided itself on a strong sense of social purpose, which continues today with your mission to lead a university of public good. And at West, we live by our purpose. And our purpose is to champion the potential of people, families, and businesses to help them thrive, just not now, but also into the future. It allows us to think about business in a much wider sense than before. As one of the UK's biggest banks, we're embedded in the lives of people and families and communities. And therefore, that comes with a high degree of responsibility and accountability. And I encourage all of my colleagues to consider the positive role that we can play for those that we serve. I also see my role as CEO of the bank as one of stewardship not just ensuring and stewarding the commercial success of the organization but also helping others to fulfill their potential for the longer term benefits of their careers, their communities and the wider UK economy. Everyone in this room today is uniquely placed to harness the power of colleagues and communities to drive public good and I'm very honoured to be among you. But we know there are plenty of challenges ahead. One of the areas that we focus on at NatWest, as well as learning and entrepreneurship, is the climate crisis. It is the biggest challenge facing our planet. And as a bank, we have a significant role to play on the transition to net zero, from supporting not only 19 million of our customers to understand and reduce their climate impact, but also to finance the transition in a fair and just way for communities. As well as climate, the business case for improving diversity in any organization is clear. Having a variety of experiences and ideas and backgrounds represented in the room leads to better decisions. Diversity is a business imperative. It is absolutely vital we have diversity of thought. Among the top quartile of companies, those with the most diverse boards have more than 50% higher return on investment and how 70% more likely to have captured a new market and perform 80% better. Therefore, it is slightly peculiar that more businesses don't understand that, which is why it is vital we continue to push on this agenda. But it is also by challenging the power of learning that we can create meaningful change. Through partnerships with charities like Citizens Advice, the Thrive program that we are working on with footballer and campaigner Marcus Rashford, we're committed to helping young people develop greater financial confidence and resilience. Because by empowering more people to take control of their finances and their futures, we're going to create a society which is financially confident and resilient. 30 years ago, I joined NatWest straight out of university as a graduate. At the time, I wasn't sure how far it would take me. Um, I didn't have a plan to be the CEO. I was interested in learning and an interesting job. But thanks to the support of trusted mentors and the wise counsel of leaders along the way, I think that decision has served me well. As individuals, we can drive curiosity and ambition to help us succeed. But if we are to change the game in the long term, we need to be brave as a collective we need to think as a team, and we need to bring fresh thinking to the challenges we face. The world we live in today is calling out for ideas, it's calling out for bravery, and people are calling out for support. 
institutions like mine must work together to rise to these challenges and drive positive change. And that's something I take very seriously in my role. Dr. Melville, Chancellor, I wish you and your team the best of luck in your tenure. Like everything you do, Heather, you will bring inspiration, courage, um, and bravery. And I know you'll be um, a great addition. I'm truly honored um, and empowered by the degree that you have bestowed upon me here today. Thank you very much. We now welcome our University Jazz Orchestra to perform Ray Charles's Georgia on my mind.
Dr. Nick Jones from the School of Arts and Creative Technologies will present honorary graduate Colin Salmon to the Chancellor. Chancellor, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce someone who is probably instantly recognizable to many of us. But while his face is familiar, it's his voice that is perhaps most distinctive. Deep yet caring, educated but relatable, soothing but composed. It's a voice that tells us what we need to know in ways that make us want to know it. It is the voice of our honorary graduate who I am delighted to be presenting today, Colin Sam. An actor of international renown and range, Colin has appeared in a staggering number of productions, covering an almost mind-boggling array of popular culture touchstones. He made his television debut in the 1992 in the award-winning Prime Suspect 2, playing a police antagonist to Dame Helen Mirren's DCI Jane Tennyson. Before long, he was on global cinema screens, appearing as James Robinson in a series of James Bond films during the Pierce Brosnan era. Continuing to challenge himself, he has more recently appeared in a cutting edge virtual reality video game, Blood and Truth. In between, he has lent his talents to everything from Midsummer Murders to 24, from parody skits to documentary narration. Whether working in television or film, video game or voiceover, in action, horror or drama, his presence is always felt. My own personal favorite, I have to admit, is the Resident Evil films, in which Colin plays a squad leader whose nasty, laser-based demise is probably one of the highlights of the franchise. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> but if this is an iconic death, many other roles have been iconic in less gruesome ways. Not only has he provided 007 himself, much needed back office support, he has also played Superman's nemesis, General Zod, in the TV show Krypton, has appeared on Strictly Come Dancing, has been rumored as a potential Doctor Who, what might have been, has voiced Cheetah, uh, the Cheetah Bagheera in a series of podcast recordings of The Jungle Book, and has even played the major critical thinker and key post-colonial theorist, Franz Fanon, in the film by Isaac Julian, Black Skin, White Mask. But he is much more than the sum of this very impressive list of acting credits. Born in Bethnal Green in the early 1960s and raised in Luton, Colin's early interest in the creative arts was musical and theatrical. He has played in a range of bands throughout his life and is an ambassador for the Notting Hill Carnival. A loving father of four, he is an excellent trumpet and steel pan player and, as might be expected, has a tremendous singing voice. In his own words, Colin found liberation in the punk and reggae scene in the late 1970s, and his subsequent activities have shown how he has worked hard to pay this forward, giving others the opportunity to find their own liberation through his stewardship and philanthropy. As dance captain of the Fox Carnival Band, he has helped build creative communities in children in Notting Hill and beyond. As an ambassador for the Prince's Trust, he has enabled young people to find opportunities that would otherwise have been denied them, especially through his involvement in the Trust's Invest in Futures initiative, which helps vulnerable young people into work and away from youth violence. As chair of the Green Park Foundation, he is involved in making leadership in a variety of sectors more inclusive and equitable through advocating and supporting talented minority applicants. As founder patron of the Next Generation Youth Theatre, he helps young people in Luton be seen and heard and to find their social and creative voices. As patron of the African Caribbean Leukemia Trust and ambassador for the National BAME Transplant Alliance, he promotes organ, blood and bone marrow donation. As founder of Cage Cricket, 
He has worked to allow a wider array of children to take part in the sport of cricket, helping them overcome social, economic, geographic, and cultural barriers, and providing learning and personal development. This incredible list shows how Colin uses his distinctive voice, along with his boundless enthusiasm and his abundant charm, to tirelessly work for others, in particular future generations. As we've heard, the University of York is committed to principles of inclusion and equality and to benefiting communities both local and global. And so Colin's work in these areas alone warrants his recognition here today. But this case is bolstered by his welcome commitment to fun. He has spoken often of the value of after-school activities and the opportunities these can create, and of the importance of democracy and the shared pursuits of community activism. He believes in laughter, festivity, and joy, not as occasional distractions, but as fundamental values that define us as human beings and which benefit society. Through having fun, we can create art, we can learn about each other, and we can carry others on our journey to a fairer society. Chancellor, this is a lesson not only our students will surely benefit from, but also those of us who work in the university and everyone beyond. That is why I am honored to present to you Colin Salmon for the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Invested in me by the University of York, I have the great pleasure in conferring you upon you the degree of Doctor of the University Honoris Causa. Let's focus on the fun. Um, well, firstly, I just want to say to the choir, that was beautiful. The human voice is a beautiful thing. And you guys nailed it. Secondly, I want to say to the trumpet players, who picked that? How did you come in? Now, this is really important for people to understand. I'm a trumpet player. So trumpet players are under the same pressure as a jet pilot. You sit there for an hour, silent, and then you have to hit a top C. And you're not putting your finger on a note. You're praying that your lip gives you the note. And that was extraordinary, because you came in top. So congratulations, well done. And it was written, yeah. And I, I, I saw you shake your head, and trust me, you hit more. The notes were great. And the happy accidents are key. And by the way, that was written by Hoagy Carmichael, not Ray Charles. And it's really important, that, because Rogi Carmichael was one of the greatest songwriters of the 20th century. I'm an autodidact. I was diagnosed with ADHD four years ago. And um, there you go. <laughs> We're everywhere, trust me, especially in my business. Uh, for years, I was a problem child. I was somebody who said was crazy, naughty, disruptive. I just saw every bird in the sky. I saw every piece of paper. I just saw everything. When I got into acting, it was like coming home. Because where else in the world can you get 200 people on the crew and then somebody goes, hold it. OK. And everybody goes, that's fine. So in that world, I'm normal. Um, regarding inclusion, that's my family. My mother's 
white, was white English. A brood note comes from the Doomsday Book. My dad who brought me up is Indian Caribbean, he's Jamaican. My blood father is Senegalese. My wife is Northern Irish. I grew up with travelers in Luton. And ultimately, I sit in the barbers and anybody gets bigoted, I just sort of go, guys, it's my family, can we talk about something else? So diversity for me was just a way of life. I don't understand any other way. Um, it's like weaving cloth. If it only goes one way, trust me, the fabric isn't strong enough. We need to weave something stronger. And I think, from the people I've met over the last few years, well, over my adult life, there's more of us out there than we sort of realize. We have allies everywhere. People care deeply. People are becoming successful and going to see what they can do to help. So I often say to young people, we stand alone together, but we will meet on the quest. Seek beauty, speak truth, but always walk with dignity. And that's the key. And for children, they have to have fun. We learn through play. I was chair of governors of a nursery school for 10 years. That wasn't in the, the, the research, and it, just want <laughs> to say that. And foundation education is, to me, the key to it, in the words, it's foundation education. There we can educate young boys who come in as babies to be the guardians of the babies. By the time they leave, the girls can say, I don't like that, stop it. They can, peer pressure can be dealt with. So many things can happen at that foundation stage. And that, for 10 years of doing that, gave me such an education. And I say to my sons, I said earlier, I'm a big guy, six foot four, my sons are six foot five, I don't like it, I don't like looking up to anybody, <laughs> but he's beautiful, so I give him that. Um, but I say to my boys, you know, when you're, when you're our size, we can do many things, but some can use that to push people down, but our job as big guys is to lift, so that's what we do. Um, to be conferred with this is such an honor, I got excluded from sixth form unjustly, I felt, and education was um, very important to me, and still is, and I read everything, and I study, and I learn, and I learn through experience. It's all applied, so it's a great honor to be given this, because uh, it made my dad proud. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this. I'm not going to sing it, but it goes like this. We hear a lot of talk about the cars we drive, Lovers we've known, diamonds and gold. The kiss and tell your business side of life. Well, to be perfectly honest, it's starting to leave me cold. It's time to think about the world we're in. There's bridges down, work to do. The fear I have inside is this gap's becoming too wide. You see, we have all seen the people on the streets. Cotton hoods, ice cold feet. Unanswered questions in their eyes. Bad things happen. No surprise. And then we read about these mothers at home. Lots of friends, yet some feel alone. Some dare to judge them without grace when they've never met them face to face. I believe it's time our villages work this out with quiet words and deeds, not blame and shout. Some say it came down from the top. All I know is this madness has to stop. It's not just about the money in the bank. It's as much about the fact that people do not say thank you or may I, would you mind? Have you got time? Would you be so kind? Because in our heart of hearts, we do know one thing, and that is no child. And I'll say it again, no child. And I will repeat, no child should be left behind. Thank you. University Jazz Orchestra will now perform Glenn Miller's orchestras in the mood.
We now welcome our new Chancellor, Dr. Heather Melville, OBE, to give her address. Wow, what a day. Good morning to each and every one of you, and thank you, Charlie, for such a warm welcome and introduction. It's such a huge honour to be with you all here today, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here in the iconic Central Hall on this joyous occasion, and also to all of those who are watching this live online on the stream. It's such an immense pleasure and honour to become your new Chancellor today, and one that I take with great responsibility and humility. I'm also proud to have a background and a career that will hopefully allow me to further enrich the strong leadership team here at the university. They are already focused on driving positive and meaningful change whilst continually becoming more inclusive so that we can attract a wider range of people to study at this outstanding university and I look forward to supporting them in the endeavour. As I look around the room today and I have done this morning, this is what the work they've done has really um, ended up in. We look at how we want to achieve goals faster by earning trust, navigating disruption, a word that I like quite a lot, and of course removing barriers. In my role at Teneo, I work with chief execs, chairs and leaders across industries to help them build much more inclusive businesses in a range of ways, including supporting their diversity and inclusion agenda, helping them to find the best talent from a range of backgrounds, some of who I hope are in this room today. I am proud to hold a number of equality and diversity roles outside of my job. This includes holding the chair of CMI Women, a chartered management institute that focuses predominantly on leadership and management. And this is something that I'm absolutely passionate about, and this is where it starts. I'm also patron of Women in Banking and Finance, a membership organisation which operates right across the UK and, as the title suggests, supports women in these sectors, helping them build stronger careers and development plans. We also work with leaders in these areas, helping them to nurture those talented women that sit within their businesses already. I happen to be one of those talented women that sat within the business of somebody who you met today, Dame Alison Rose. I've been really blessed to have had a few quite proud moments in my career, but probably my proudest moment was receiving my OBE. And the reason I say that is because it was for the work I do around inclusion and entrepreneurs, something that's very close to my heart. After the 2008 global crash, bankers weren't th thought of very highly. So for me, being recognised for work in that space was recognition for our whole industry. And actually, being a woman of colour just made it even that much more special. So perhaps it's apparent then that I'm really looking forward to driving the inclusion agenda into everything we do here at York, so that everyone feels a sense of real belonging when they join our community, be that in person or virtually. When I was asked whether I would consider the role of position of Chancellor of the University of York, I was, of course, deeply humbled. But even more so, I was so excited at the prospect of working on behalf of an organisation that has public good at its heart, drawing on a rich tra tradition of social justice and combating inequality. This is so very important to me and close to my heart. As part of the prestigious Russell Group and indeed the wider network of universities across the UK and beyond, higher education is a rich cultural, scientific and economic asset. As our, as our university vision states, our work here clearly does and should be economic benefit, but our ambition extends beyond economic impact alone. Our ambition is that our expertise and its impacts help create the conditions needed for all parts of our society to flourish. With that in mind, I am really looking forward to meeting more of you and to learning more about the fascinating research, positive partnerships, excellent teaching and learning opportunities that run through the heart of this university. As we reach more and more people across the globe through opportunities to study with us, partnerships in research and public engagement and philanthropy, we remain a university with a proud, profound sense of place and the importance of our local community. Those local communities and indeed our global networks are facing some of the toughest challenges and economic pressures in living memory. 
I am so impressed by the way our research, our partnerships and our teaching foster a sense of purpose and a determination to develop collaborations that bring benefits for generations to come. In a world so often afflicted by short-termism, our research, our teaching, our wider sense of purpose must be focused on how we can positively influence making society better for more people and more sustainably for the longer term. The University of York has a strong and proven record of bringing together academic disciplines to tackle the challenges of our time and our community of over 140,000 alumni in 180 countries around the world continue to contribute their talent and experience. The York Unlimited Philanthropy Campaign, nearing its target of almost 120 million and 120,000 volunteering hours, exemplifies that warmth of engagement. Our focus in fostering inclusion in our access to education, our determination to be more inclusive in our approaches on how we recruit staff, our ambitions to have no attainment gaps in our educational outcomes, our goals to enhance our mutually beneficial partnerships with global partners, businesses, business industries and of course charities, as well as our ambitions to provide an empowering educational experience for all of our students. All speak of a university that wants to do things in a way that materially demonstrates our commitment to being a university for public good. It's not just what we do, but how we do it that will really make the difference. In the following few days, some two and a half thousand graduates will become graduates here on this stage, and as our graduates take their next steps into their early careers or further study, I will be calling on them to remember and treasure the things they have embodied here. The consideration, kindness, personal accountability that they have shown here and experienced at York should become their personal kite mark, and in the same way they have all contributed to their student and local communities, we know that will bring this keenly developed sense of social purpose and public good to their work. The University of York has a strong tradition of engendering curiosity amongst its graduates, which gives them the confidence to challenge the status quo. And whether it's an inherent appreciation of trust and of meaningful collaboration, we know that they will in turn influence others. I'm honored here today to have been able to confer honorary doctorates upon the two people whom I feel also engender these values and act as inspirational role models for all of us. Dame Alison Rose and Colin Salmon. Earlier on in my career, Alison was my sponsor and her mentoring and support is something that has stayed with me throughout my career. It allowed me to challenge, drive, make decisions, feel empowered and feel special and included as a black woman. I have long admired Colin too for going right into that heart of the communities with his work, for creating action and for holding dear his values and principles around equal access and nurturing of talent in children and young people. I want to once again thank the Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Charlie Jeffrey and his leadership team who have welcomed me into the York community so readily and so warmly, and of course his beautiful wife who entertained me last night for a most scrumptious <coughs> dinner. I want to thank all of the staff who work tirelessly behind the scenes to make the university the success that it is. I have to tell you, every element of this procedure and this procession today has been outstanding. Now more than ever, the world needs the brightest minds to come together to pull their knowledge, their compassion and their problem-solving capabilities. Universities are a beacon of hope because over centuries they have expanded the frontiers of knowledge building on each generation's hard work and commitment in the pursuit of truth, justice, and through the enabling power of education. Everyone graduating over the next few days offers another layer of hope that we can work together to overcome challenge, prejudice, and of course, injustice. As my predecessor, Professor Sir Malcolm Grant, to whom we all so, so, owe so much to, famously often remarked, it is rare that anyone says, I wish the Chancellor had spoken for a little longer. <laughs> so all that remains is for me to say a huge thank you to every single one of you and to wish all of our graduates who are graduating over the next couple of days the most wonderful career ahead of them. Thank you very much.
Robert Hollingworth and the 24 will now perform The World is Charged by Joanna Marsh. Joanna, Joanna wrote this in lockdown in 2021, and it sets the Irish poet John F. Dean. It's a very mindfulness poem. I was startled by the squawk, the simultaneous long-tailed and sprague-winged, half-spectacular, half-dive of the cock pheasant. His wattles, his bronzed body up over the hedge, and see there the Japanese anemone, pea green heart with a scattering of gold. And here, humbler still and local, see the mare's tail weed and the quick reaching of the briars. Note too how the tiny pimpernel persists along the driveway from the red gate to the front door. Astonishment from heart to eye to ragwort, from there to woodlouse, eucalyptus, owl, and on to Sirius and the plough. And we have been years she and I, walking by fields where generations lived and loved, have laboured and have disappeared, with their sheds and implements and cattle, into the deep where they stay resonant in their silence, their poorer cottages crumbled into liquor of rosehip, dust of nettle, knowing that we too will be with them, alive and loving in the warm light that still persists hereabouts, and everywhere, and forever. I was
thanks again to, uh, to, to Robert and the 24. I think with the jazz band as well, the musical performances have been uh, uniformly outstanding. Thank you. Now, Chancellor, um, I hope you will forgive me my impertinence. Now you are installed, you're really the boss of this ceremony. But I'm going to uh, seize control of it for a moment. Um, as you will have seen, it's a convention for the incoming Chancellor to nominate uh, honorary uh, graduates who represent the values that we share and I think with with Alison and Colin we have really seen that as champions of diversity in their fields uh, Alison somebody who's who's done an awful lot to restore the reputation of a sector which fell into a bad reputation uh, and, and Colin as, as someone who symbolizes something really really important for this university and that's the importance of the arts and humanities and the way that they hold a mirror up to ourselves so that we can judge ourselves better. Um, so you, you really do reflect things that are important to us. But Heather, we wanted to add one other surprise element into your very special day. As you will be aware, there is a tradition in the UK of the nation's poet laureate recording uh, uh, um, re recognizing significant national milestones. So we thought we would borrow that tradition for our milestone today. Uh, and to that end, we worked with our fantastic colleagues, Professor Helen Smith and Dr. J.T. Welsh, in our Department of English and Related Studies to commission a poem to commemorate and celebrate this milestone occasion of your installation as our seventh chancellor. Now, as luck would have it, and a bit like London buses, we ended up with not one, but two poets, Chloe Turner and Emmy, Emily Thorrington, uh, who were inspired by two journeys which now align, your own personal journey that's led you to the role of our chancellor and, and our institutional journey as a university for public good. Chloe's poem, Your Odyssey, is a mythical representation of your career leading you to the University of York. And Emily's poem, For the Public Good, is focused on your destination here at York and what we can accomplish together on the basis of those shared values. So let me now hand over to our two poets, Chloe and Emily, to give the inaugural performance of their poems. Your Odyssey. Odysseus sailed home, nymphs scattering to escape the swaggering glint of his hull. Each ebbing voice would join your chorus. You followed their siren songs on the tides, rising like your pen to paper, the set of your jaw, the stars you charted with their Greek fire talents. Talent was four de decades of documents, silver, and the minds you changed. Ithaca was miles away. But on sleepless nights, the vineyards whispered the verdant legend of she who heard them. The stars, the coins, the girls. You were there. There, your sails billowed with a thousand long-suffering, laurelled sighs, carried you to shores that needed you. Kings and gods alike knew your name, your prophecies, your call to arms. One echoing seat was not enough in a sea of lives unlike yours. Your beacons were fueled by the splinters of doors you burst through and all that followed. Don't let anything hold you back. The coffers were filled with women's work, the path forged in the tread of the brave. Brave honors were many, legendary. Each island hailed you with a different name. They toasted you doctor for the wounds that you healed. You were bearer of medals and burses, 
chair at the table, patron of knowing there has to be more. More than Atlas, you shouldered the dreams of the crowd. The fisher women on the docks had the deft fingers of heroes. Looms rattled with the pace of potential, echoed applause. Actually, you can do this. Do everything. Everything changed, grew, glittered. Seeds that you planted could sprout where they chose. The lives you touched unfurled like petals, like rope on the deck that you spurred through the storms. This was your odyssey, the weight of your name. Here we were, waiting for you. For the public good. On our campus winding, with willows vibrantly green, listening through the seasons for spring. We are building relationships between sports and eating at Greg's Place, between Heslington Hall and spotting Longboy by the lake. We are embarking on wisdom, enriching our earth through innovative ideas and teamwork, connecting at the University of York for the public good from friendliness and excellence in faculty, through undergraduate and postgraduate studies, we are problem solving, gears turning, ears learning. We are yearning to know, to be known, to be better citizens of the places we call home, learning for the public good. We are multidisciplinary, Diverse in abilities, ages, nationalities, bringing passion and purpose to our conversations, collaborations in the arts and sciences, maths and psychology, humanities, sociology, engineering, public policy, collaborating for the public good. Working in unity, students and faculty, bus drivers, food servers, and maintenance team, chaplains, librarians, and security. Our perspectives and nationalities strengthen us. Our abilities together, beautiful and robust. Teamwork for the public good. Wisdom cries aloud in the streets, and our ideas rise from our seats. Our research pools from the lake, outside of campus, through the city gates. Our ideas create businesses, help hospitals, name festivals, innovating for the public good. University of York students, staff, and faculty, on this 18th day of January, let us remember to relish the adventure of learning each day, to cherish each other's invaluable worth, to care for our inherited earth, to step forward with our university's vision for growth in diversity, equality, sustainability, and accessibility. Let us join together in welcoming seventh chancellor, Dr. Heather Melville, to our University of York for the public good. I now declare this ceremony closed. Please stand. <laughs>